Fantasyproject.com. Fantasy is escapist, and that is its glory. If a soldier is imprisoned by the enemy, don't we consider it his duty to escape? If we value the freedom of mind and soul, if we're partisans of liberty, then it's our plain duty to escape and to take as many people with us as we can. Hollywood used to be a place where dreams come true, but now we know it's a place where dreams and trends go to die. And after watching franchise after franchise fall prey to identity politics, activism, and creative bankruptcy, you can't blame anyone for being a little skeptical when they see what looks like an innocent headline like this when it comes to Lord of the Rings on Prime. This is from IGN which has been in their own trouble of late because they stuck their nose in a conflict that they have no business talking about considering that they're a entertainment and gaming website or supposed to be lord of the rings needs to work for a giant global audience says amazon studios chief and that is jennifer salk and i wouldn't argue with that statement on its own but unfortunately i know about the giant red flags that amazon has been planting over the last two years for the time will soon come when hobbits will shape the fortunes of all. For the black speech of Mordor may yet be heard in every corner of the West. I think that would be a more appropriate byline. The stakes are high for the Amazon Studios' upcoming Lord of the Rings series, with a reported first season budget of $465 million. Actually, it's been reported much higher than that. It will be one of the most expensive shows ever made. How do you justify such an expensive endeavor? Speaking to The Hollywood Reporter, Amazon Studios' chief Jennifer Salk said it was mostly due to the madness of the market and not for the passion of the project, noting that Netflix paid four. $469 million for two sequels to Knives Out. (laughs) Bet you're feeling pretty good about Hollywood getting bailed out now, don't you, fellow taxpayer? But she also revealed Amazon's lofty expectations for the forthcoming prequel. As for how many people need to watch Lord of the Rings, a lot, she laughs. A giant global audience needs to show up to it as appointment television and we're pretty confident that will happen salk said well she has to sound confident because i'm guessing her job is on the line and that's where the problems start that's where she and i will differ on what is appealing to a giant global audience i think It's a good story. I mean, I know The Lord of the Rings has been such a niche success, selling 150 million copies worldwide, being translated into 57 languages, two film trilogies that have made well over $6 billion combined. And I'm sure there's room to grow with that. I'm just not sure you're capable of doing it, Amazon, considering all of those previously mentioned in my past videos Red flags, including Opie and Opie, the two inexperienced showrunners with bad reboot connections who have only written a bad Star Trek movie. There was John Howe, who was the conceptual designer on Lord of the Rings, being brought in to essentially just draw a map and show up on their trailer, and he was never called back. As well as Tom Shippey, the Tolkien scholar, either being shown the door or walking through it on his own. Then, of course, there's Bad Reboot itself, which only last summer made statements like no more white comfort. Then, of course, there's all the actors who have come and gone and the rumors of nudity with the hiring of an intimacy coordinator on top of Jeff Bezos saying he wanted a Game of Thrones. It seems Amazon is insistent on repeating the same mistakes of their fellow repurposers. Why? Well, Let's start with Lord of the Rings is pretty much everything Hollywood hates right now. He was a very deep, profound Catholic, Roman Catholic, and this comes out in his books. Now, the Lord of the Rings is not a religious book in that it's not about God and the angels and so on, but in fact, it's a very religious book in tone, and he knew this while writing it. It's really, um, it's, it's a book which tries to convey the feeling of religion to a world which is not actually a believing world, and a non-religious world. This, I think, is largely why it's been so popular in America, in what is on the whole a, 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 a kind of godless modern world. 
um, it particularly appeals because it's 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 bringing uh, it's bringing religion back into fiction. Now I'm not a religious person, and I didn't get all of that out of the Hobbit or the Lord of the Rings. To me, it was just a good story, but it's most certainly in the Silmarillion, and you have to wonder how Amazon is going to work that out in an era of critical race theory. We saw Disney just got popped. You don't think Amazon has the same thing going on, particularly with bad reboots, peripheral involvement? As you may or may not know, this show is a prequel taking place in the second age of Middle Earth, a time period lasting thousands of years. And as you probably know, most prequels end up doing more damage than good to their story. So again, I'm very curious to see how Amazon approaches some of this material, particularly with the island of Numenor and its eventual fall. Essentially, there was a split on the island between the faithful who were completely good with the rules set down by the Valar and the one god, Eru Iluvatar. And then there was the Kingsmen who, despite their very prosperous and long lives, were envious of the Valar and the elves and their immortality. Over time, the Kingsmen become more corrupt and envious, and one character who married his cousin to become king, Arpharazon, eventually captures Sauron but falls under his influence. He builds a temple to Melkor, or Morgoth, essentially the devil, and starts the practice of human sacrifice. A story that's a little bit Noah's Flood, a little bit Atlantis, and all about turning your back on God. You see, Amazon is repeating the mistakes of their predecessors, Disney, Star Wars, Star Trek, and Doctor Who. By playing identity politics games, you win identity politics prizes, and it invites all types to fandoms, including the activist. For example, there is an activist blogger who wrote this masterpiece claiming they're a fan of Lord of the Rings, all while at the same time calling Tolkien a racist and the story racist. Just some guy did such a savage takedown of this woman, she was so embarrassed that she had to false flag the video. Whose minds do you think you're going to change about resisting when you say you have a narrative that you want to quote, endorse and weaponize to proclaim our spot within fandom spaces? You're attacking people for being fans and you wonder why we don't want you in our groups. You're welcome to pose wherever the fuck you want, but you can't do it here. You're not going to call every Tolkien fan racist or the fandom white supremacy. You're not going to trash the lore. You're not going to impugn Tolkien's character by lying about his opinions. If you want to do that, shit, you can go. Don't let the gates of Moria hit you on the way out. Then we have this. Mortal Kombat star Ludi Lin criticizes Amazon's upcoming Lord of the Rings series for apparent lack of any characters that look Asian. Now, this is obviously an audition. He wants a job. This is how you do it in Hollywood these days. He, now, he got some clap back for his audition, and of course, he followed it up with racism. Make no mistake, I ain't bitching, just a bit disappointed that one of the best fantasies in the world isn't showing love to all fans in the world. Gotta say, though, anyone who thinks Lord of the Rings is for white folks only because it's purely a white fantasy, you gotta check yourself. Nobody is is saying that if you want to be a fan be a fan but if you're here to hit your wagon onto a story just so you can get your political message across and sacrifice another franchise on the altar of agenda then leave now and never come back if you want to be a fan of something try not leading with you're a racist you see the imposter the tourist the activist the poser the fake geek will always out themselves if they're such a big fan you would think they would know something like this he was creating a history a myth um a mythology for england he called it and um that involved not just a story it involved geography cartography geology ethnography any other ography you like um he had to do it all and he did and we all know the response to this, don't we? Oh my God, Tolkien is such a colonist and a fascist. Be silent. Give your forked tongue behind your teeth. I have not passed through fire and death to bandy crooked words with a witless worm. Naturally, every show wants to garner a large audience, but Amazon is setting a high bar. For the Lord of the Rings. In today's world of fragmented entertainment and fragmented audiences, fragmented fandoms, and a fragmented country, few shows can be called event 
television. And there is a reason for that that I will get to in just a moment. Like its competitors, Amazon appears eager to fill the void created by the Game of Thrones, it's almost like a poser wrote this article, which capped off its run with a finale watched by 19.3 million viewers. It will face competition from Disney's run of very successful MCU and Star Wars shows, <clears throat> as well as a planned Game of Thrones prequel which has a lot of similarities to Game of Thrones. No, not the actual content within the show, but what they're adapting. History books, very thin history books with no dialogue. This is the Silmarillion, and they want to make five seasons out of this with eight to ten episodes each. We all saw what happened with The Hobbit, and it didn't turn out that well, and that was with Tom Shippey. The party. What the f is going on there? The Lord of the Rings, which is the greatest trilogy of all time, is that because a bunch of crazy guys and gals with a lot of money and a lot of creativity set out to make something they love by honoring the original creator's work. Well, we we, we didn't want to put any of our own, certainly in terms of the thematic material, we didn't want to put any of our own baggage. I mean, we had no interest in putting our messages in, into this movie, but we thought that we should honor Tolkien by putting his messages into it. And we thought he cared about things. We, you know, he, you know, the countryside and the, and the, and, and, and the rise of evil. And, and he, he cared passionately about certain issues. And we thought what we should do to honor him is to make sure that 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 his what he cared about ends up in the movie that's what we tried to do lord of the rings can't just be a mild hit it needs to be a massive hit and we understand something jennifer sulk and her ilk never will each other the paying customer the audience the fan you can't just go out and create a cultural phenomenon. You can't create love within the fandom, no matter how much money you throw at it. But you can make the best story possible. I know I play that Peter Jackson clip a lot because it needs to be heard a lot. It should be on a constant loop in Hollywood. In the meantime, Jeff Bezos, Jennifer Salk, and Amazon want to make a more relatable and accessible Lord of the Rings when it already was. He that breaks a thing to find out what it is has left the path of wisdom. Listen, you bought Lord of the Rings at the wrong time. Best thing to do is not make it or wait a few years, but you're well into production and I wish you all the luck in the world and I hope I'm wrong about all of this. I would like nothing more than to review a great Lord of the Rings show every week on this channel and just have a little fun. And I'm glad to hear Jennifer Salk is confident that a giant global audience is going to show up to her Lord of the Rings, but I think it's far more likely we're going to get a slightly intersectional feminist, slightly woke Lord of the Rings. And if that's the case, then it's going to be a massive catastrophic flop. And if that happens... Fell deeds awake. Now for wrath. The ruin and the red dawn. Oh, ah! Nerdverotic.com. Please subscribe. And before the sun had fallen far from the noon, out of the east there came a great eagle flying, and he bore tidings beyond hope from the laws of the west, crying. Sing now, ye people of the Tower of Anor, for the realm of Sauron is ended forever, and the dark tower is thrown down. Sing and rejoice, ye people of the Tower of God, for your watch hath not been in vain, and the black gate is broken, and your king hath passed through, and he is victorious. Sing and be glad, all ye children of the West, for your king shall come again, and he shall dwell among you all the days of your life. And the tree that was withered shall be renewed, and he shall plant it in the high places. And the city shall be blessed. Sing, all ye people. And the people sang in all the ways of the city.